Welcome to Behavioral Grooves. My name is Kurt Nelson. And I'm Tim Houlihan. In this episode, we are visiting with our very first return guest. Yes! This is the first time for Behavior Grooves to publish a second episode with the same guest, and we are super, super excited. We are absolutely excited. But first, I have a question for you, Kurt. Of course you do. <laughs> okay, so how much time do you think you spend trying to get people to say yes to you, at home and at work? So at work, people say yes a lot more, at least for the people working for me because I'm their boss. What about um, your clients? But clients, <laughs> I spend an awful lot of time trying to conv- – not I, – I, I spend a fair amount of time there. Now, now with, what about at home? At home, it's all the time with my kids. Oh my god, <laughs> it's the never-ending battle. It's like, can you clean? You know, can you clean out the the dishwasher? Uh, you know, can you clean your room? You know, getting them to say yes is hard. Getting them to say, and it's usually about getting them to do things that they don't necessarily want to do, but as a family, we want them to do. That is a great question because it leads right into this episode. Brian Ahern is the founder and chief influence officer at Influence People, a consultancy based on Robert Cialdini's principles of persuasion. And more importantly, he is the author of a new book highlighting the application of these principles. It's called, you guessed it, yep. Influence People. Yoo-hoo. Powerful everyday opportunities to persuade that are lasting and ethical. Yeah, Brian wrote the book because he saw lots of great research going on, unheeded, because it is difficult to put into action. Brian tackled that in the book by linking the principles to very specific cases and applications in the real world. This is a really real world read. For those of you who are tired of books with big ideas, but no real world applications, Brian's book, Influence People, is right up your alley. We talked with him about key parts of the book and wandered into discussions on how well Frank Sinatra and Coldplay work in the same playlist. That was something that you just found crazy, but love. I, I, I did. Go figure. All right. So in a little twist on our featuring sharing listener reviews, we captured Brian saying that he was glad to return to our podcast after doing bunches of others to promote his book. So let's listen to Brian. But I, and, and this is, but this is no bull. Truly talking to you guys is the most fun. I mean, I think the connection that you have where you're laughing makes me laugh and um, they're all, I've enjoyed them all. But but getting to actually meet you guys changed how I felt about everything and, and being there and stuff. And so this was this was a blast. So sit back with an ethical dose of your favorite beverage and listen to our second conversation with Brian Ahern. Brian Ahern, welcome to the Behavioral Grooves podcast for the second time. Thank you very much. It's uh, an honor to be back here, and I'm glad that you guys were willing to have me back. That's a good sign. You well, are the first two-time guest, so we are excited about it. I am too. <laughs> it's probably because you're extraordinarily persuasive. I think that was it. Uh, and then, But like Kurt said, maybe it was just the power of asking. <laughs> yeah hey we're suckers what do i say I don't know. You know? are we not so discerning no we're we are discerning and we're, we're really glad to have you here because because the first the first time that we uh that we talked we had an, uh, an absolute blast right here in the uh in the behavioral group studio yeah, that was that was quite an honor too because i know not very many guests make it to the studio yeah, That's true. not many, not many get to see the wonderful dining room of the Nelson abode. <laughs> so, uh, but, but this time we are not. We are actually at a distance. You're you're uh, wearing your Ohio State socks in in the wonderful state over there, and uh, we're here in Minneapolis. So uh, we'll see how this one goes. So let's start. Uh, we are here and uh, excited that you are now an author. And you have a book, uh, Influence People, and I think we should uh, we should talk a little bit about that. What what do you want? Uh, and by the way, we'll we'll put uh, how to get a hold of it in the show notes and that sort of thing. But what uh, what do you want to let listeners know about uh, about the book? Well, I wrote the book because while there is lots of great material out there from Daniel Kahneman, Robert Cialdini, Dan Ariely, and others, and it's fascinating and obviously. It touches on something because they're such big sellers. What I have found when I work with people is a lot of times 
they don't know how to apply what they've learned. They read the fascinating studies, they're intrigued by it, but then they go back and they keep doing what they've always done. And my book doesn't go deep into the science. It's all based on that, though. But it's all about how can you take this and practically apply it in things that you're doing at the office and at home. And, and the, the basis for that is my, my why, to use Simon Sinek's term, is to help people enjoy more professional success and personal happiness. And I believe a great way to do that is if you understand how to ethically influence people to take action. That's a key part of the book is the ethical application. This is, I think this is really central to who you are and absolutely central to the book. And I think that that was really cool, but, but you've got lots of great examples. I want to ask, why do you think it's so difficult to translate the books that are more scientific into day-to-day -day life? I think sometimes it's just how your, how your mind works. You can go somewhere and be entertained and then leave and just go back and do what you've always done. But my mind tends to work where I would read something and right away my wheels start spinning about, oh, here's how we could use it in the office or here's how I could use it at home, maybe raising our daughter. I just don't know that everybody is wired that way. So some people you've got to just give it to them in black and white. Here's an example of how to use it at work. And they either can do exactly that or start seeing some variations on how they might be able to do that. Oh, <laughs> no, yes. Tim's looking at me. <laughs> no, there no, you go. No. I, this is our. Yeah. So with that, help us understand a little bit more about the book. Influence people. People isn't just a, you know, the people out there. It actually stands for something. Let's talk a little bit okay. about that. I don't remember exactly when I landed on this, but it was quite a while ago, uh, nine or 10 years ago, when I was thinking about influence and I would think, well, influence is all about people because we can't persuade things. It doesn't matter how good I am at influence. I can't come home and talk to my lawnmower and get it to start on a hot summer day. But there, there have been times I've talked my my daughter or my wife into doing that and persuaded them ethically to help me out and cut the grass. So as I thought about that, it just it came to me one day that people is all about the powerful everyday opportunities to persuade that are lasting and ethical. And that's what for me, that's my framework. That's what people means. And 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 that's in, that's really important. So I just want to be really clear about the obvious here, that people, P-E-O-P-L-E, -E, that word has has those uh, five, uh, six, uh, yeah. the six uh, words that, that, that go with them. So let's, let's talk about a couple of them. I think the ethical part is really, uh, again, that is something that, that Kurt and I really um, focus mm -hmm. on and we enjoy and benefit from uh, is an ethical focus uh, and an ethical application of these tools. Tell us about how you look at the ethical application. Of okay. These. When, when I, first of all, to step back, I will tell you if it weren't for the ethics part of this, I would not be doing what I'm doing today. I would not have started influence mm -hmm. people. I would not have written the book and, and the whole trajectory of my career would be different. And that's because when I came across Robert Cialdini's material, part of what intrigued me was his focus on non-manipulative ways to get people to do things. And, and he was talking about this at Stanford, and Stanford used to put out these videos called breakfast briefings, and I signed up for their marketing. And one day, one of their marketing pieces came across my desk at work, and it said at the top, bestseller, right underneath it in bold letters, call it influence, persuasion, or even manipulation, right in the headline. And I thought... I can't believe they actually use that word. So I emailed Stanford and said, I don't know anybody who wants to be manipulated. Don't know anybody who wants to be known as a good manipulator. That word cannot be helping sales, but it really could be hurting. And I never heard from Stanford, but sometime later, my phone rang and it was a representative from Robert Cialdini's office calling to thank me because my email prompted a change in the marketing of their material. And that's where my relationship formed with him. And ultimately, he came to Ohio and he spoke at the insurance company I worked for. He spoke to uh, some of our agents at some big conferences. I went through his workshop and, and the rest is history. I, I was so intrigued by it that I wanted to, to get certified and begin to teach this. And, and now it's what I do full time. But if it weren't for the ethical component I wouldn't have sent the email. I wouldn't have had that contact. And, and my, my life would be very, very different. So I think that's the best testimonial I can give to how important the ethics part of this is 
for me. Well, I think it's a big component for a lot of people in the in behavioral science because behavioral science can be used unethically. Mm -hmm. And so as you pointed out earlier, sometimes it's that transition of, you know, you can read the research, but, you know, some people's brains work mm -hmm. right away and, and going into application and various different things. I think there's also this component of sometimes we have to point out the ethical use because people might just use this, not thinking through all of the ramifications of it. And then unintendedly be a manipulator or do things that may be unethical. And that's one of the hardest pieces of behavioral science, particularly, I think, for people who are just getting mm -hmm. into this. Um, I don't know, your thoughts on something around well, that? Well, when it comes to the ethical part, I think it really goes to the core of who we are. There will be some people who learn this and use it for manipulative means, and there'll be most people, I believe, will use it in a good way. There's a quote from a book called The Art of Woo, which means winning others over. And it goes like this. An earnest and sincere lover buys flowers and candy for the object of his affections. So does the cad who only seeks to take advantage of another's heart. But when the cad succeeds, we don't blame the flowers and the candy. We question his character. So flowers and candy are neutral objects. These principles of influence and, and other things that we mm. learn in behavioral economics are neutral. It's how people choose to use them that either becomes ethical or unethical. And I think that comes from the core of who somebody is. I, that is fantastic. I, I, those components of, of that, it's the candy and flowers, and those are, those are not the pieces. It's, it's how they get used and, and who uses yeah. them. So, so let's well, talk can about- Can I say one more thing on so, this? I think, I of think course. sometimes we unintentionally hurt our own cause when we're not clear on the words that we use. So for example- I bristle when I read articles online about tricks or tips to, to mm -hmm. influence people. I don't know about you guys or your listeners, but the only time I want to be tricked is when I go see a magic act. And I know I'm going to be tricked, I, and, and that's the fun of it. Um, I don't want to scare people into doing things. When do I want to be scared? When I go to a scary movie. So I think we need to avoid certain words like um, the tricks of the trade, uh, even, even, you know, when, um, Robert Cialdini wrote influence science and practice, and he talked about the weapons of influence, I think we need to steer clear of that because no, how would somebody feel if they knew you went to a workshop to learn how to use weapons of influence weapons? That is yeah. not a good term in today's society. And so we need to be very thoughtful about how we, how we talk about this. Otherwise we're hurting our own cause. Yeah. What separates uh, an ethical use from an unethical use in your mind? Well, I think there's three components to that. The first is, is what I'm going to ask of that other person good for them, not just good for me? Do I really believe that maybe the product or service that I'm selling, or if I'm a, a leader in an organization, what I want them to do, is it good for them as well as good for me? The second thing is, am I being truthful? And when I talk about being truthful, we don't lie by omission or commission. In other words, we don't hope that somebody doesn't ask a question because we don't want to deal with that. What you learn as an ethical influencer is you can actually talk about some of the perceived weaknesses or shortcomings, gain credibility, and transition over to your strengths. So we're always honest. And the third thing is we use the psychology in ways that are natural to the situation. We don't manufacture false scarcity. We don't say that there are more people buying when, when they really aren't. We don't do that to try to manufacture something that's not genuinely there. But if you understand these principles and you begin to employ them, even if you can't tap into scarcity, you've got five other principles, six other principles to tap into to be more effective in your communication than you had been in the past. So let's talk about some of the other uh, words in, in people here. So powerful. Okay. When you talk about powerful every day, what, what are those powerful every day kind of things that you're talking okay, about? Okay, well, uh, powerful really goes to the heart of the fact that it's all rooted in the social psychology and the behavioral economics. And even more recently, neuroscience can show us what brains are doing at certain times. But this isn't somebody's good advice. You know, there, there's a lot of famous people who will do or say things, and they may move people to action. But it's by the sheer fact of who they are, that if any one of us tried to use the same tactic, we'd fall flat on our face. So 
we don't want to rely on someone's good advice. We want to rely on empirical data. And that's why I say it's powerful. When people understand some of the research and they see that, you know, 30% more people said yes or two times more or uh, 150% more, that's really compelling. And that's where that the power comes because we've taken this out of the realm of um, folklore, uh, wisdom, good advice. And we're saying, no, here's, here's the foundational information that says if you do it the way, A, you're going to be sig- significantly more persuasive than if you do it the old way. And I always, I, I get really upset with people when they write those books and that's from, well, this is how yeah. I did it. And well, yeah, you did it that way. That doesn't, and, and it's great if that's just a biography and, and you're looking at it for that way. But if it's an advice book, that's an N of one. And an N of one is always suspect because as you said, it could be because of their, just who they are as a person, some other factors that are outside of the control. And so it doesn't translate into something that can be useful for a vast majority of people. And so basing it on that empirical evidence, fantastic right. work. And that's so, and, every day. And so that's, that's why here talk about what the, what the research or the psychology says, but now here's how to use it. So it's not the good yeah. advice. It's, it's the practical application. Um, as far as the everyday, uh, I always like to ask people when I open up a public presentation, how many of you would agree that much of your professional success and personal happiness depends on getting others to say yes? And every hand goes up because intuitively the, the people know at the office, whether they're selling or trying to get their coworkers to do things or their leaders, they've got to get people to say yes. But then they start thinking about it and they realize life at home is a lot more peaceful and happy when those around you are more willing to say yes. So it really, it spans all of your waking hours. And then the other thing that's compelling that really catches people's attention is uh, some Dan Pink mentions in To Sell as Human that there was a survey of 7,000 American business workers who were asked the question, how much of your day do you spend trying to influence, persuade, or convince people in ways not related to a sale? And the average that came back was 40%. And so now you step in and say to an audience, okay, here's a critical skill and you're spending more than three hours a day at work using it. Doesn't it make sense to learn how to do it well? And all of a sudden the heads are nodding and they're, they're bought in. Kurt and I had a discussion recently about uh, the influence of data in our lives and how as a society, as a world, we're becoming more data oriented. And I'm getting back to powerful here, Brian, but I'm wondering, um, do you think that uh, we are more receptive as a, as a culture, as a, you know, uh, as a business community around the world? Are we becoming more uh, comfortable with relying on data so that data as a way of establishing credibility is more effective today than it was, say, 20 years ago? I think it's probably more effective, but there's also a couple of downsides. Uh, Stats usually don't change people's opinion. Um, Talking about the masses that need help is never effective as talking about that one individual. So you could almost make a case to say that the statistics aren't really what's moving people to action. It's still the empathy that, that we have when we see one individual. The other thing I think that's dangerous about just saying we're gonna rely on data in insurance, there's a huge trend to, to move towards more and more data. So what I saw was an influx of people who are really, really good with data, but didn't really know the guts of the business. And when you don't, when, when you layer something on top of something that you don't know, you can make errors and not realize that you're making errors. So uh, I think the pendulum is going to swing back down where people are going to say, yes, data is really important, but we have to combine this understanding of data with this deep understanding of the business. Otherwise, we can make some really, really bad choices um, that can have big ramifications. You know, when you go with insurance as an example, if you put out some rates based on data and it's incorrect, you could have thousands, tens of thousands of people buying your policies. And then all of a sudden that company's losing a lot of money because their rates were totally inadequate. It's interesting because you talk about data without knowing the business. We've also talked with a few people where, uh, they, they're working with data scientists, but the data scientists don't understand uh, people, right? They don't understand the behavioral science behind things. And so they're looking at this and just looking purely at these, these numerical components. And they're wondering why, well, 
look, this should have moved this needle there, but they didn't take into account that we are emotional creatures and that we we don't necessarily respond just the way that the data would would sometimes indicate that we would. So I think there's that mix of both the business, but also that people component uh, in those aspects it, as well. It would almost be the same mistake that economics had made, and then all of a sudden behavioral economics says you're not actually correct in, in this now big data could kind of do the same thing. And you've still got to come back to the fact that it's impacting people. And how do people really respond? All right. So we have a couple couple letters left in the people. Let's just go over them quickly. I don't think we need to necessarily get in. Opportunities, persuade, and lasting. So those are the last three. We already talked about the last E. So, so opportunities, I think once you learn something, all of a sudden your eyes are open. You begin to spot opportunities that may have been there all along. Uh, if somebody teaches you uh, a tactic of an unethical salesperson, you begin to spot it everywhere where before maybe you didn't. So when it comes to learning this, though, from the side of the influencer, once you begin to learn the language of influence, I think you'll be pleasantly surprised at how often you see opportunities that you just did not recognize before. When it when it comes to persuasion, I, I really default to Aristotle's definition of persuasion, the art of getting someone to do something that they wouldn't do if you didn't ask. Um, the reason I, I default to that is because I think persuasion is much more than changing people's thinking or convincing them, because that will do no good if their behavior doesn't change. So it really, mm. for, for me and the people that I work with, the component is, does it actually change people's behavior? It does you no good to tell your child to clean the room and they say, oh, that's a great idea, dad. <laughs> that's what my son does yeah. all the time. Yeah, sure. I read, I read sure. some articles that clean rooms are a good idea. That is good. Yeah. No, get in there and clean your room, right? That's, that's what you ultimately want people to do. You want to see that behavior change. And that segues into lasting that sometimes if it's done well, it can tap into a part and change somebody's self-identity and take on a lasting change. And my personal example for that was... Um, when I was in college and shortly after, I was a competitive power lifter and a competitive bodybuilder, and I loved the gym, and I hated running. But a friend who was a fitness trainer persuaded a number of us that we could run the Columbus Marathon, and this was many years after I had stopped competing, and I really didn't want to do it, but I, I yielded, and I started running, and I fell in love with it. And that was almost 20 years ago, and given a choice to, to lift weights or run, I will run every day if, if that's the only choice I can make because I feel better, but my self-identity changed as I began to run and I fell in love with it. And I think there are times where we can interact with somebody, maybe it's a, a child who doesn't like school, but you, you finally get them to study, they get an A, they feel good about themselves, and it begins to take on a life of its own because they see themselves as smart. And when when that happens, it's great because then you don't have to go back to the well over and over to persuade them. Now, I also want to be clear that that doesn't happen every time. Um, some kids just may not still like school. Uh, my wife my wife ran the marathon too, and she doesn't run at all anymore. So it didn't, you know, but but for me or whatever there was in me, it touched something and it changed my self-identity. Yeah, this is this is a really an interesting part of uh, how things do, so, some things change uh, and influence us. They get into our psyche and they uh, change mm -hmm. us and, and some things don't. Uh, I, I wonder if this goes back to your comment about, about the, um, the, the wooing idea of, uh, you know, it's, it's not so much the data, but it really is the experience, right? It's, it's how it's being used. The, the CAD is, is manipulatively using the same tools, the same data points, if we were to, to take this metaphor out. And, uh, and, and the data is kind of neutral. How we respond to it is still something that's our own. Absolutely. We, we have to ultimately own that. You know, for me, I will say I've always been a very competitive person. And I think the running tapped into a competitiveness for me. It was like, okay, I'm not going to ever be as big and strong as I was before, but here's something brand new and it's, it's fueling the competitive part of me. And as I did that and I got in shape and, and I really started to get the benefits of the endorphins and, and all of that, it just changed me. Now, my wife at the time wasn't as competitive and for her, it was, it was the experience. It was like, oh, I want to say I ran a marathon and she did. And then people would ask me, oh, do you think she's going to keep running? And because I knew her pretty well, I said... I wouldn't be surprised if she never ran again <laughs> and because for her, it was like, I, that was really cool. I'm so glad I did it, but 
I don't feel like I need to keep doing it. For me, there was this drive of, I want to see how good I can get. Can I continue to better myself? Because that competitive nature from growing up, maybe that's what it was that, that tapped into it for me. Going back to the book, um, there was a story that you told about um, changing response rates on, a, on an email, uh, getting, getting different response rates just by changing a few words. Could you, could you share uh, with the readers? Uh, with the <laughs> readers? <laughs> They've already read the book. They don't need to do that. You share with our listeners who have not yet bought the book. Exactly. There you go. Thank you. Just, <laughs> just, just follow okay. on here. <laughs> just keep going. Sure. The, the example that you're, that you're referencing that I talk about in the book, uh, I was uh, part of my duties at the insurance company were to help um, boost the number of agents who would sign up and represent our company as an independent insurance agent. And so we started marketing to these agents. Our field people would put in some information online. We'd have all that information. And then quarterly, we'd send out some marketing. One of the pieces that we would send out <clears throat> At the end of the third quarter, we had been missing an opportunity because we didn't know about scarcity. Once we learned about scarcity, that people value things more when they're rare or going away, they, they just want that more. We stepped back and we thought, well, you know, we don't look to appoint a lot of agents in any given year. A lot of times it was around 50 and we were only working in about 30 states. So that's not very many. And, and okay. so we incorporated a, one additional paragraph at the end of that letter that might have said, Tim or Kurt, part of the reason that I'm contacting you today is to let you know we're only looking to appoint 50 agents in our 30 operating states. To date, we've appointed 40. We hope you're one of the few remaining that we appoint before the end of the year. When we added the paragraph and then we shot that email out, my boss came over to me within the hour and said, I can't believe it. And I said, what? And he goes, eight agents have already contacted me. Now, eight may not sound like a lot, but he said, I've never had an agent contact me within an hour of sending that email and eight have already gotten back. <laughs> so here's the vice president of sales, arguably the best sales guy in the company who has an opportunity by phone or email to interact with these agents and convince them that you want to start writing business with state auto insurance. That's a, that's a relatively small win that most people could utilize because they're sending email all the time. Remember the, remember the days yeah. we used to complain that we can't get our work done because of email, and now we realize our work is email. <laughs> well, and so using that scarcity message within there, right, was this, this prompt to get people, again, from that perspective of saying, this is interesting, but now this is interesting, and I need to move on this because I might only have a limited opportunity in order to get in one of those 10 right. spots. And so, again, to that ethical component of it, you, you weren't manipulating that for perspective of saying, yes, this is all that we have left. That was actually true. You were going to have 50, you already had 40. And so it was just stating the case in a different manner that, that drove that. And I think people, we miss those opportunities because to your point, we're not thinking through that. And we're not taking that, that application right. of these principles into our everyday life. So well, and speaking of everyday life, let's let's talk about that's a great business example. That's a great example for being at work. What about at home? Give us an example from the book that uh, could uh, enhance life at home. Okay, um, I talk about you, the power of using the word because, and there's a study by Ellen Langer who uh, measured response rates to people's willingness to let others go ahead of them in a line at a copier uh, photocopy store. And when somebody would just go up and make a straight up ask, let's say, Tim, you're at the front of the line. And I say, excuse me, may I go ahead of you? I have five pages to copy. 60% of the time, people would say yes. When they incorporated a reason using the word because, they, they'd start with the same and say, because I'm in a rush, almost everybody, 94% said, sure, go ahead. And then testing one other variable, they would use a bogus reason. May I go ahead of you because I have to make these copies? Well, we're all in line to make copies, right? <laughs> but, right. but people right. didn't necessarily think that through. And 93% said, sure, go ahead. So the psychology behind that is we are conditioned by the word because from childhood. I mean, most kids, when they say why, mom or dad says, because I said so. So I taught my daughter this. I, to I told her when she was young, I said, Abigail, I told her that story and she could imagine it. And I said, whenever you ask somebody to do something, make sure you say, because 
and give them a reason because they'll be more likely to say yes to you. Some time passed, we're watching the old American, I say old American idol, it was, you know, not the <laughs> the first but, round. Yeah, it was early <laughs> on and, and they'd come out with the American Idol CD. So that shows you how old it is. And oh. Ryan Seacrest <laughs> is, is in front of a music store with a long line of people using consensus to get you to think everybody's buying the, the CD. And each time he'd try to make his way into line, into the line, people would motion him back. And he ends up, by the end of the commercial, he's at the back of the line talking about the CD. And out of nowhere, my daughter says, he should have said because. <laughs> I, I was yeah. like, yeah. I go, what? And she goes, Dad, don't you remember the copier study? And I'm like, yeah, I do. <laughs> but I was, I was I think, floored that she remembered that. So we're we're going to have to put a link in the in the show notes about what a record store is, though. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, it's like a furniture store, but it sold music. <laughs> yeah. There you go. All right. All right, so Brian, the one uh, the one story that I loved was your sticky note. Seven hundred thousand reasons oh to god. use sticky mm-hmm. notes. So tell that story briefly, and because uh, I think it's just it's it's powerful. Oh. Right. Yeah, it's it, it was really powerful for the company when I was working with them. So what ended up happening was when I came back from an extended Christmas break early in January, I got called into a, a meeting with half a dozen other people. And the problem that we faced was this. We had overpaid 150 insurance agents in one of our operating states in the month of December, accidentally doubled their commission which was a $700,000 mistake. Our charge was not to figure out why somebody else was doing that. Our charge was to come up with a game plan to get the money back as quickly as possible. Because in January, the company is also getting ready to pay out bonuses to insurance agents. And it'd be nice to have an extra 700 grand in the bank. We decided this was back many years. We couldn't just press a button and electronically take it back. A letter was going to have to go out from the home office accounting manager. So imagine, guys, that you're an insurance agent 500 miles away, and you get a letter from the home office accounting manager, somebody you've never met, probably never spoken to, and he or she is telling you, you owe six, eight, ten, twelve thousand dollars $12,000 because we overpaid you. Please write us a check as quickly as possible. Probably not the highest priority for you during that day. <laughs> <laughs> not at all. That's that's one that gets put off on that yeah. to-do list all later. All of a sudden, for me. cold calls are better than sitting down and writing <laughs> right. that check. Well, fortunately for the accounting department, I had done some training the year before, and the accounting manager had been in on that, and I reminded him of it. And, and the training was basically this. One component talked about a study where a a company that was sending out a survey wanted to see if they could positively impact the response rate. So they had three variations. One was send the survey with the cover letter. And when they did that, people, 36% of the people responded by filling out the survey and sending it back. When they personalized it with a different group, same survey, same cover letter, but they wrote a personalized message on the cover letter, 48% of the people responded. So that's a pretty nice bump for taking just a few moments to personalize the letter. The third group got the same survey, same cover letter, same handwritten note, but it was on a yellow sticky note. And the response rate was 75%. Wow. So it more than doubled. And and one of the other features was the people who responded to the survey under that condition gave more complete answers and sent the surveys back faster. So I, I turned to Steve, the home office accounting manager, and I said, Steve, remember the study on the sticky notes? And he said, yes. And I said, if you don't have time to put a sticky note on every one of those 150 letters and, and personalize them, call me, I'll do it. And he said, I remember and I will do it. So I called him up a, a few weeks later and said, how's the collection going? And his exact words were, I'm floored. And I said, why? And he said, we've already gotten money back from 130 of the 150. Wow. That's terrific. Yeah. That is such a great now, example. I, being the optimist, said, you mean we didn't get it all back? And he, <laughs> and what about those yeah, other 20? Yeah, yeah, what's well, going he, on with those? He guys. did exactly what you guys did. He laughed at me and he said, come on, man, we're talking about money. I, I expected people to say, it's your mistake. You fix it. Put me on a payment plan. Take it out of next month's commission. He goes, anything except to sit down and write a check and send it back. He said, I'm floored. And when we had lunch a few months later, he told me that we ended up getting money back in full from 147 of the 150 where they voluntarily wrote the the check. 
so that's for me, that's a perfect example of reading this interesting study and then clearly seeing the opportunity that we probably would have missed in the past. And it had a powerful impact on the company and it was all ethical. So that's right. As I say, that's that's my framework. And and I think that kind of opportunity is available for everybody if they begin to learn the language and then start to think about how could I do this a little bit differently? Yeah, I think that's a it, it highlights this component of saying we you would have gotten a certain amount of people responding just normally, right? right? Like the, the cover letter on the first was 38%, 36%, whatever that was. You would have gotten some some level of comp- of compliance with that. The fact that you then took that to the next step and used the the behavioral science principles behind mm-hmm. that, right? The, that element of saying, oh, they are using some insight here actually just was that enough to be able to take that to the next level. And I think that's what the, the application of behavioral science that we try to talk about all the mm-hmm. time is this component of saying, you know, it isn't, it isn't always rocket science. It isn't yep. this component that, yes, you can read Kahneman and you can look at the math. If you look at any of the studies, you read a George oh, yeah. uh, Lorenstein, you know, research paper. And, and sometimes I sit there and I just, my, my mind goes, you know, crazy because I'm looking at all of the mathematical components that they have in and all of the different terminology and language. But in the end, what it comes down to is it's understanding why we do what we do. Mm-hmm. And, and, and knowing that those aren't always the, the rational components that we would think through if we were actually going as the homo economists, right? That, that we would be, you know, rational agents all the time, that we are actually people and that there's emotions and that there's these factors that come in, the, the aspects of, you know, reciprocity, the aspects of, you know, social proof, all of these mm-hmm. factors, scarcity, all those things that you're going, they shouldn't have an impact or not the impact that they do. And so being able to apply those, which I think your book is the the piece that allow brings that home, right? And the stories bring that home very vividly. And so uh, I recommend uh, highly that people go out and, and, and Let read Let me say this. one last thing about the, the guy, Steve. So here he is. He's in a home office accounting manager. I mean, your ultimate um, logical, analytical person who probably would have poo-pooed that stuff in the past until he saw it. Then he became such a believer that when his town had a school levy, and he still had a couple daughters in school, it was coming up, and it had failed the prior time. They sent 2,500 <laughs> um, flyers, FAQs, to people who had not voted, and they superimposed a sticky note, and he personally signed all 2,500 because he was that oh much of gosh. a believer and it passed by a wide margin. Huh? Oh my gosh. That's the, uh, again, the power of influence. Yeah. There it is. Yeah. Um, you're out to change the world. Aren't you, Brian? Well, I got to, I'd like to change my wife first, but <laughs> <laughs> hey, hey, does she listen to this? Cause you might've just, you know, jinxed she did, that. She there did listen go. to the episode when I was on before. And I think I told you guys, she said, those guys sound like a lot of fun. And I said, it was, it was, it was a lot of fun. <laughs> we, now my wife and I have a lot of fun with this stuff. So, so um, it's not always ethical. So I'll give you an example. She asked me, she asked <laughs> okay. me many years ago. She, she said, hey, do you mind if I go to Scotland? Joe, that's my stepmom. Joe's turning 65 and really wants to go golf. And I want to go. And I said, yeah, I kind of mind because I want to go. And now is not the right time. And then she said, ah, fine. You mind if I go down to Florida for the week and play golf with her? I'm like, no, I don't care. She comes back <laughs> later and says, I never really wanted to go to Scotland. I knew you wouldn't say yes to that. But I knew it would make Florida a lot easier, you know, compare and contrast. <laughs> She goes, you teach this stuff and you didn't catch that? I said, my radar is not always on with my loved ones. Uh, with you, honey, I was expecting, yeah. you know, truth Ethical and honesty. Treatment. There yeah. you go. Wow. Pulled the decoy effect right we, there. We have, wow. we have a lot of fun with it. My daughter is pretty steeped in this, too. She was raised with me. I, I used to tell her, I said, Abigail, when you get older, you're going to need counseling. And she'd say, what's counseling? I said, you'll know soon enough. You'll realize you were my little experiment. <laughs> oh my oh, kids oh. my kids have already they, they 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 come up to me and they go are you using that psychology stuff on me and i'm like oh yeah yeah okay uh, brian you are captain playlist uh, and when it comes to when it comes to music uh you are are one of the most fervent 
uh, users of playlists that uh, that we've ever talked to. Um, and so let, let's talk music. Okay. Let's talk what what what's going on musically in uh, in your life well, these days. D- did you wait 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 before before this? I want to ask a, a very specific music question. This is rare for me, right? So it is okay. It is. So I'm in, curious. In, in writing this book. Did you have a playlist that you use to write, or do you write in silence? This is a big ongoing thing with with Tim and I. I do a little bit of both, and, okay. and as I was working on the book, I, I I won't say I had playlists, but I there were certain genres that I was listening to. For example, I got turned on to Hamilton when I was at a learning conference late last year, and was so intrigued by it, I was listening to it all the time. So I listened to a lot of the Hamilton. Um, yeah, yeah, as I was doing it, we we saw the movie Bohemian Rhapsody, and then all of a sudden, mm-hmm. I'm like, "Gosh, I forgot how many great songs Queen had." So, so as I was working on the book, yes, I listened to a lot of music, but it would it would just be like diving into these things that brought back all these great memories for me. But it wasn't a single; I didn't have a, a, a single playlist. But I did have a playlist for you guys today. Because as I was getting oh. ready, in addition to wearing my Ohio State socks so I would feel like a, a winner, I was listening to Frank, Frank Sinatra and Coldplay, and I called it Frank Play. Frank Sinatra <laughs> and Coldplay? Yeah, I love them both. I don't care. I can mix whatever I want. Okay. So what, g- give us some samples. What are, the, what are some of the tunes on the, on the list? Um, yellow. Um, I love um, Viva La Vida and um, The Way You Look Tonight. I always, it always makes me think about my wife because I think she's beautiful. And um, so I always think of her when I'm that uh, I did it my way. You know, I'm thinking, oh, I wrote the book. I did it my way. And um, so it was just various songs like that. <laughs> it's just such a juxtaposition of, of Frank and Coldplay in my head that I'm just going, wow, they don't seem like they they mix together. But, but you, when you start talking some of those songs, yeah. I'm starting to go, well, oh, I, actually, I, yellow. Yeah. yeah, that kind of, you know, you could mix that in. In with yeah. uh, did it my way and kind of things like that. When so, I do workshops, so yeah. you know, if I've got my um, MacBook, if I'm operating off of that, I'll just turn on my playlist and and I kind of go from from Frank Sinatra up to Boston and all kinds of things in between. And and I always tell people it's my clean playlist. It's not like my workout playlist that might offend somebody, but <laughs> but people, I mean, people love that variety and and it's it's such notable songs and and it just i don't know it seems to elicit these good feelings people want to sometimes stick around during break because they just like to hear the music it is interesting um i've done a lot of work with a gentleman by the name of michael carrison um tim actually did some work with with us on a, on a program but uh there are these multi-day workshops uh working with organizations and trying to move them to the next level of various different things with their managers and we are and he is very specific on his playlist, right? As, as we talk about, um, now his is actually, I think Tim loved it because it was all pre 1978 music. Um, (laughs) you know, that's his, that's his genre, but he uses it and, and it worked really well for a while. And now I think that the, as the age, some people are aging out of, we're getting younger and younger people who have, who haven't grown up on some of that music. And so, uh, they don't have that, the connections back to it, but it worked really well, um, you know, 15, 20 years ago when we started doing this. Um, so Michael, if you're listening, we need to update that, that playlist. But one thing that I find really interesting with him is he uses brick house as the, the comeback (laughs) song. And so as opposed to, you know, he said, well, we have about a 10 minute and then, you know, about nine minutes in, he'll start playing brick house, which is a two minute and 30 some second song. He is exactly down to the, the thing and people need to be in their seat. And so, Forever in this day, my my memory and, and connection with Brick House is just this. Oh my God, I got to go sit down because that's the that's the callback music. I, so. I also just to comment on on Michael's use of playlists. He is really good about curating it in such a way that he said he'll he'll come up uh, before the next section. And say, okay, I'm I'm going to tweak this a little bit in this next section. So let's start the the songs during the break with this tune. Yeah, you know, I mean, he, he's curating the list sort of in a in a real time manner, which is really I think that's I, cool. I, I experimented with 
having uh, like a theme for each break. So maybe during the break, it was going to be Johnny mm. Cash. And then the next time it was Coldplay and people started to like pick up on that. And they're like, what's going to be on, what's going to be up next. I'm like, maybe, maybe you should yeah. hang out during break and you'll find out. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, I think again, to that component music, particularly in a workshop setting has a ability to, to, to lift emotions or to, to change those emotions. And it, it can influence the, the outcome of that workshop much more so than, than we often kind of think through that, right? And we, we, we don't think through that. We just put on random music or we don't put any music on at all. And I think that can right. be a mistake. And to that, to that so. point on influencing the workshop, I, I went to a training event as an observer because I was I'm going to do something with, with this organization and I was invited. They said, you should come and, and sit on this to see how things go. And I wasn't very far into it. And I texted my wife. I'm like, oh, my gosh, I'm about ready to take this pen and jab my eye out. This is, <laughs> and, and it was the, the individual obviously knew their material, but didn't understand how to convey it and, and started off with thanks for coming here today to listen to me drone on and on. And probably thought he was being self-deprecating in his humor, but continued with it like, well, if you haven't fallen asleep by now, uh, I'm going to show you a video. It has nothing to do with what I just talked about, but I think it's funny. And it was just such a downer. And wow. and, and I've always believed, even, even some smart people don't get that. I'm like, I ask the question when somebody comes in, why are you excited to be here today? Because you know that when they self-generate those reasons for excitement, they will be more excited. They will be a more engaged learner. And, and so many people don't do that. Music's an aspect that can change mood, but the very words that we use will create thoughts, feelings with the people who are attending anything that we're doing. You're priming them. Exactly. I mean, you, you literally are priming yeah. them to say, oh, I'm going to, you're going to drone on. Well, now I will notice every time that I think you have gone a, a second over what you could have, have done, said something earlier, whereas your component of what gets me excited that thought is now not in your brain. Your, your neural connections are actually focusing in on, wow, what he just said was really exciting. And, and even if he drones on for another two minutes on that, that component, it is still about that excitement. And so that component is really about all about priming and very, very real in this Absolutely. aspect. Absolutely. It makes it, it, that's one of those little things that can make a big difference. That's one of those opportunities that people don't necessarily think about that could really help move the agenda forward. Because if, depending on where you are, if those people learn what it is that you're trying to convey and they put it into practice, that's a multiplier for your organization. It's a powerful everyday uh, <laughs> opportunity <laughs> <laughs> to persuade and making some lasting ethical that's components right. there. All right. Well done. But with that... I just have to ask, what is going to get you excited today, Brian? Well, we were going to go over to my nephew's house because my brother and sister-in-law were in town, but that got mixed up. So that means Jane and I will get dressed up and go out. So I'm excited about that. Oh, nice. Enjoy nice. your Friday night. I, <laughs> I, I, I will definitely do that. Hopefully my back doesn't go out on me. <laughs> oh, yes. Yes. Well, Brian, as always, Thank you. This has been fantastic. Um, great, great conversation and great insights on the book. So um, best of Thank luck. You. With I that. appreciate it. But, yeah. Best of luck, Brian. We, we hope that uh, every, every listener is able to uh, get a copy of the book and we'll have uh, links in the, in the I show appreciate notes. It. You guys are a ton of fun. And even though I couldn't be there, it was nice to see you through the application and, and to laugh and talk. We enjoyed it as well. Welcome to our grooving session where Tim and I groove on what we heard in our interview, talk about things that we find interesting, and whatever else comes into our people focused minds. I dig that. Yeah. Yeah. People. people. It's a good, it's a good acronym. All six elements are good. Yeah. I think it works because there's an E at the end, though. Be oh, ethics, right? Ethical. Ethics is huge in this, and particularly as we think about... Well, it's, it's huge for us. Well, it's huge for us, right? Yeah. We've talked about it many, 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 many times. And maybe even more than that. Many, many, many more <laughs> times. There you go. Yeah, but it, it is huge, and I think it's, it's, it's a part for Brian that's very integral to who he is, and it's one of the reasons I think we like him. Yeah. Um, but 
ethics has such a it can be such a slippery slope in this behavioral science world. And I loved his component, and and this is a, I think what I want to talk about is when he talked about bringing flowers and candy and the intentionality behind that. And so, you know, you can be romantic and and doing it out of the generosity and, and goodness of your heart, or you can be a cad just trying to, you know, get that kiss or whatever it is. Um, and he says that the candy and flowers are just tools and they're neutral. And I know we talked about this a little bit before. So what are your thoughts? Well, I was just, I, uh, I had to question is the tool always neutral? Okay. So let's go to something like a chainsaw. A chainsaw. <laughs> as candies and flowers or a chainsaw. Here well, we go. As a tool, right? And uh, granted, it, it's not a perfect metaphor because we're, we're talking about psychological tools and people which have many more variables than than chainsaws, but let's take a chainsaw and you want to cut down a tree. Okay. And, and because you're, and you're choosing a chainsaw as the tool because it's faster than an ax. Right. And more efficient than an ax. It's better than the ax. It's for many reasons. It's better than the ax. Okay. However, in the hands of someone who is not skilled, the tool is, is, could be very bad. It could, could be, be dangerous. Could you be dangerous. Could chop off a hand, a leg, a leg. <laughs> you could you could send that tree down on top of a car or a house or or, or somebody or, else or somebody else. Yeah. So uh, and so maybe there I'm saying that it's about the skill of the user, but I think that it also still has something to do with the fact that that the chainsaw was chosen and not an axe. It's, okay. it's less likely to happen with an X. So if someone is uses these sophisticated tools who is not skilled, it, I think that the tool is, I don't know if it's responsible, but it is, it's, it's, it's gonna, an actor in the outcome. Yeah, it is. I think that it has a, a, a place. Yeah. I don't think we can, we can just to, totally say, and I'm not hundred percent sure on this, but I think that we can't totally say that the tools are completely neutral. So to, maybe try to reiterate this to ad nauseum like we always do. Um, I am not going to go down and chop a tree down and back a big old tree. A, because it's just way too hard. I know with an ax, I'm probably not that good, but hey, you give me a chainsaw. And even though I'm not a tree cutter downer, is that a word? Oh, uh, totally. Yeah. And so <laughs> even though I'm not that, but I, I go, gosh, I have a chainsaw. I can do this. It shouldn't be that hard. I should just be able to, you know, cut here, cut here, and the tree will fall right down here. But I don't know that. and Because you I, don't have skill. Because I don't have skill or the knowledge or the experience. And, and it might work. It mm -hmm. might just work great. Or it could go horribly wrong. Yeah. And so you're saying behavioral science has that same potential. potential. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, and again, and so, but, so we could say it, it's more about the skill of the user. Brian, if Brian were here, he would probably argue, no, Tim, it's really about the skill of the user. But And of course, and their intentions. But as a user, I'm not going to chop that tree down with an ax. I'm not even no. going to attempt that, right? That just way seems too hard. But, but if now, you're, because you're, I have, a, you, because now I've been given this chainsaw, which I can, you know, pull and vroom, vroom, and it seems really cool. Now that you know about loss aversion, you could use a loss frame to get a more emotional response from someone. Right. Even when that may not be the appropriate way of doing it and not thinking about the unintended consequences that using that behavioral science principle or bias right. uh, getting into that would, would have. Which is certainly related to the skill of the user. However, I still want to hold the tool itself culpable on some level. I think that's a stretch, but I think it is it's, a stretch. <laughs> it's, but but it, it brings a really important point, and particularly around when we're talking ethics, and we talk about this all the time, is that particularly with behavioral science, the unintended consequences of our actions can be significant. And yes, you will always have CADs out there trying to use these things in a negative manner. Right. I think the bigger potential issue is not the CADs. It is people using these without fully thinking through all of the ramifications. Yeah. And and by the way, thinking through all the ramifications is really, really hard. Right. Because we're talking about people. We're not talking about cutting on a tree with a chainsaw. Yeah. It's really easy to read a book and say, oh, I'm just going to apply these things it's very without difficult. actually thinking through that. All right. Great.
Okay, let's talk about opportunities. Let's talk about the O. The O in people. Or is we it- talked to the E, now we're going O, <laughs> O-E-E-O. Well, this idea that it opens your eyes, yes. right? If, if, you, if you open your eyes and you see the opportunities, there are tremendous numbers of applications. Yeah, I, that is an interesting component, right? And, and what I loved about it is talking about seeing, under, once you understand how people are influenced, you see it being used all of the time. Yeah. You- you see it being used both positive and negatively. And so that helps in some of these ethical considerations yeah. that we have. And so I think that's a really key component of that. Oh, it's like the Wilhelm scream. <laughs> the what? The Wilhelm scream. <laughs> Is that some German, you know, <laughs> punk band? What? Uh, oh, no, in, in movies, the Wilhelm scream, you know, it came from this, um, this movie, like in, the, in 1950 or something. Okay. It was some really cheesy cowboys and Indians kind of movie. But this guy, the actor that was playing Wilhelm, screamed in such a way that it was a classic, it became a classic scream. <laughs> and so other movie editors, Foley artists who use, you know, those kinds of sounds in movies started using them over and over again. And the Wilhelm scream has been used in more than 400 films. And once you become aware of it, once your eyes are open to the Wilhelm scream, you will hear it in every movie that you'll hear it in Toy Story and Star Wars and, and Indiana (laughs) Jones and all these great movies. They use the Wilhelm scream. (laughs) That is the most random, crazy, (laughs) kiki thing that you could ever bring up. That's awesome. No, it's so booba. (laughs) <laughs> okay. The Wilhelm scream. <laughs> no, uh, I'm yeah. gonna have to. I'm gonna have to look that up oh, now. Yeah. And now you're gonna ruin all these movies for me because now I will know <laughs> that that scream was actually not even an uh, uh, actor was, no, in the movie. It was some pulled from 1950, and they just put it in the background. Is that how it works? That's it. <laughs> Wow. That's it. And gets reused and reused and reused. It's pretty great. All right. Okay. Um, okay. What else do you want to talk about? I want to. So the last thing I think is he. Brian brought up this component about self-identity, mm, yeah. about how he now thinks of himself as a runner, but he hadn't before. He was a lifter. And it took somebody inviting him to run and kind of influencing him, persuading yeah. him. Persuading him to run. To, to run. And, and where I wanted to go with that is this component of how that switched his mindset about who he was and various different things. Yet it didn't switch his wife, right? Right. She was persuaded. In she a, in did a, the, the marathon way. as well. But she didn't become a runner. But she didn't become a runner, didn't self-identify with a runner. Um, and so this goes back to, uh, I, I think, in work, right? Do we give people opportunities? This is going to be a stretch. Do we give people opportunities to or invite them to maybe explore are you a runner if i was a power lifter before can you be a runner so if you're in marketing maybe give somebody the opportunity to say hey maybe you might want to go into sales or human resources or some other right, thing right right um i don't know just your thoughts I'm thinking of the uh, Steve Sisler comment about hammers and tomatoes. Ooh, getting the tomatoes into the salads and getting the hammers into the the toolboxes. And I don't know if we know. I don't know if we know ourselves well enough to be able to just say, no, 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 I'm a hammer. Don't ever put me close to a salad. So for people who haven't listened to the Steve Sisler episode, he's talking about using personality assessments yes. and identifying. Hey. Um, I am this type of person. And we too often, uh, he used the analogy of putting a tomato into a toolbox and how good is that? You know, that tomato is going to get squished in that toolbox. So you put people in positions that are going to um, allow them to put the tomatoes in the salads, put the the hammers into the toolboxes. So if we don't know ourselves all that well, we won't easily know what the better situation is. We, in fact, Brian is a great example, and his wife. They didn't know how they would respond until they tried it. So Brian became a runner because he tried it. So he might have, he could have been a runner all along, but he just never tried it. So his, here's 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 my piece on this: is is personality and who we self identify as 
changes. Right. So it doesn't change overnight, typically, unless there's some traumatic component. And it, but, might, and it might not change dramatically either. It might not change dramatically at all. It may not change. You, you might be the same person you were when you were 21. That's what we used to think. More recent research indicates that we do change over right, time. Right. Um, and, and our self-identity about ourselves definitely changes over time. And so I think sometimes we get pigeonholed. We, we put people into positions and they excelled in those positions. And now they've been in that position for 10, 15 years and they are now, this is who they are and what they do. And sometimes I think we just need to ask. We need to get them to be not a, not a power lifter, but maybe ask them to be a runner. And, right. and yeah, for some people, for Brian, that may be rejuvenating and great. As for Brian's wife, I, no, I tried being a runner. I don't want to be a runner. But you need to give that opportunity and that, that uh, availability for people to, to potentially do that. And I think too often we just pigeonhole people into roles and positions based on what they started off status doing. quo bias i mean oh this is what they've been doing let's just keep them doing and and we, it applies to ourselves oh I've, yes. I've been doing this i've been doing fine i'm just going to keep doing it but we also crave diversity we we crave novelty you know we, we, yeah, that we're, personality we're openness curious. component and various different else yeah there. from the from the big five all yeah, right absolutely okay music yeah so you know i wanted to ask you yeah, I know. You always want to ask me things about music. It's just you who you are. You are the music asking question person. Brian was talking about his Frank Sinatra Coldplay uh-huh. setup, right? So uh, do you have, do you have, uh, have you ever put together a list? I know that we've talked about this, you know, that, that has really radically different All the time. sounds that work perfectly together. I don't know if they work perfectly together. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Nothing in my life ever works perfectly. Um, but yes, I mean, I think that is definitely the case where I will intermix very different genres, very different styles of music. I used to make mixtapes where I would have, you know, um, bright and dark as two sides of the, the mixtape. So my one side of the tape oh, would be wow. kind of happy-go-lucky songs, and the other would be my more depressive, sad kind of songs. Or, um, wow. you know, and various... Or, and I often mix in, like, I did it a lot more when I was listening to industrial music. Sorry, couldn't come up with my yeah. boo-boo mind again, was being very... Which is which is really harsh stuff. Yeah. And, you know, it's, it's this kind of grating kind of component. And I'd mix that in with actually some very uh, soft, you know, guitar, acoustic kind of soft kind of music that would be this just position between the two. Yeah. And it would really work. And actually, it, what I, I would do a lot, not a lot, but, but one of the things I, I would talk with many people is um, Ministry the Band. I don't know if you yep. know who yep. they are. Again, big industrial. <laughs> yes. Big industrial band. Yes. But their first album is very pop. It's very new, new wave pop. And, and uh, Alan Jurgensen, the, the lead singer, won't play any of those songs. He hates it. He said it was driven by the, the, by the record company and, yeah. and the producers. Yeah. But when you listen to it, it has this really bright kind of sound with a little tinge of this undertone of what they're going to be. And then you play that against like, you know. The later work. The later work. Like a, the mind is a terrible thing to taste or, you know, some of the, the work on that. And you put those together. You're laughing. I'm laughing. Me. My God, it's just the mind is a terrible thing to taste. It's yes, just, it's, just it's, it's a, a great album for those who like industrial music. There we'll, you go. We'll have a link to it. Do you have a clean list and a and a and a not clean list? Brian talked about having the public list and then his workout list, which could offend people. No, well, I mean, I think if you know using things in meetings and in as walk up music and various different things, I I don't necessarily classify it by clean or not, but when I'm doing workshops and I'm leading training sessions. You have a specific list for that. I, I actually no. I, I use a Pandora station now. I oh, used to have okay. I used to have a, a list of, of music that I would just bring in, but now I just use a Pandora station because I think it brings in more variety within that genre. Cool. Great. 
All okay. right. So thanks, listeners. Uh, thanks for hanging out with us uh, for in this episode. If you enjoyed this discussion, please give us a, uh, a rating, a nice rating, and a review would be even nicer. And as a little teaser for you people who stayed through the entire episode, Tim and I are going to be in Philadelphia in October. October 17th. And we are going to be doing a live session with our 100th episode. And we have Annie Duke lined up as a... More to come. And we will have more people coming. So if you are in the Philadelphia area, mark October 17th. If you're anywhere near and you want to drive in, let us know. We'd love to have you there. And it's going to be awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.